Greetings, guitar engineers. I'm Desi Serna. And in this video, I want to take some time to talk to you about whether or not you should learn how to read music. So I get a lot of questions from people that are either just beginning with guitar and they ask me if they should learn how to read music first, and questions from people who have played guitar for a while, uh, they're an experienced player, but they wonder if maybe reading music is going to kind of help them take their playing to the next level. So I want to talk about uh, when you shouldn't learn how to read music, and I'll talk about uh, times when it probably would be a good idea for you to consider it. And I'll talk about um, how you can go about doing that if you, uh, if you choose to do it. So, so let's dive in. Um, if you're first starting out with guitar, um, I don't think that reading music is the best way to approach it. I've been teaching uh, and playing for decades, and my experience has been that most people uh, that want to play guitar, they want to be able to pick up a guitar and play familiar songs, you know? So they want to be able to strum chords, you know? They want to be able to play some familiar riffs. They want to learn how to play some guitar solos or play some blues or something. and so on. So usually when people want to play guitar, their intention is not that they're going to, you know, um, approach it like a concert violinist and go play with an orchestra, or they're not looking to play classical music where, uh, you know, the majority of the repertoire that they would need to learn is going to be in standard notation. Most people want to play pop and rock music. And you're not, when you watch people play that style of music, whether, you know, people are just jamming with friends at, you know, at someone's house, or you go out and see a bar band or someone play, you don't usually see people reading music. In fact, that's <laughs> that in that situation, you're not likely to ever see people actually reading standard music, uh, musical notation. They might be reading a chord chart or something. I'll, I'll talk about that um, later. So typically, people just learn by rote, and you learn how to uh, memorize songs. Uh, on guitar, we make use of uh, uh, neck diagrams or chord charts and tablature, um, and it's just an easy way to figure out where notes are located on the fretboard and where you place your fingers and how songs are played. And I do believe that that is the best way for most people uh, that fit, fit the description that I just gave you to to learn how to play guitar because it's going to suit their <clears throat> their needs. If you're learning how to read music, you're really focusing on Honestly, you're kind of focusing on something else. If you go out and get yourself like a, uh, you know, a beginner level guitar book like uh, Mel Bay's Modern Guitar Method Grade One, uh, and there's others that are similar, this really is not a book on how to play guitar. Believe it or not, it's a book on how to read standard notation for the for the guitar. I'm having a hard time opening this up and showing you. It's really a book on how to read standard notation. In other words, you could complete this book, and there are others uh, <clears throat> in the series here. This is grade one. It goes all the way up to grade seven. You could complete a book like this and still not have uh, the skills to sit around a campfire and just strum a, str a, a sing-along or to go sit in with a band and play you know, a really popular uh, classic rock song, something like that. You're really focusing on... <clears throat> learning how to read music and follow the music uh, on the fretboard and playing notes. And, you know, you're, you're going to be playing stuff like When the Saints Go Marching In and a bunch of old-fashioned melodies, you know, Shenandoah, The Blue Bells of Scotland, you know, stuff that, um, if I just put this down and play a little bit, you know, of it here, you're going to be doing stuff like, you know... <laughs> so on, right? Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated than that. They introduce uh, um, some chords where you start doing stuff like, you know, that sort of thing. But <clears throat> you're not actually, you're, you're kind of learning how to play in a style that is quite different from what you would do if you were playing mainstream pop, you know, pop and rock music. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't some benefit to it. Still, I'm going to talk about 
when you might want to learn how to read music. But generally speaking, if you're starting out and you fit the description of someone that just wants to play some popular songs on the guitar, I don't think that you should be uh, learning how to read music, and I don't think you should worry about it, and I don't think you should feel like you're cheating or there's you know uh, and anything about your approach that isn't good enough because uh, you're leaving that out. That's the way most people learn how to play. That's how I learned how to play. I learned some you know uh, chord shapes and stuff. Friends would show me how to play you know some some simple songs and, and how to strum and how to play some riffs. And I just kind of took it from there and learned learned how to play songs. Now eventually I did learn how to read music, and I'll 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 talk about that here soon. So, all right, beginner guitar, I don't recommend you learn how to read about, uh, I don't recommend you learn how to read music, unless you're someone that's listening to this and you're like, I don't really want to play pop and rock music. I want to play old-fashioned, you know, uh, uh, traditional uh, melodies. I would like to play classical guitar. Or maybe you're someone that um, you've played piano for years so you're just completely programmed to play by reading standard notation and you like the the you know the songs and the repertoire that typically go along with that approach to teaching piano or maybe you played another instrument maybe you played clarinet for years or something like that and so you're used to playing you know this you're used to playing this type of music on clarinet or some other instrument and you enjoy it and you want to do something similar on guitar you're not interested in playing necessarily songs by the Eagles or Eric Clapton or John Mayer or whatever. You actually want to approach the guitar like you have approached piano or an orchestra instrument or something like that. In that case, okay, maybe go ahead and uh, um, start that way. Start with a method book like um, Mel Bay. Now, in all of my years of teaching, which are many, it's, you know, it's been decades, I don't know that I've ever had a student like that. Um, that's that's come to me and said I want to learn how to play the same melodies that I played on clarinet growing up as a kid on the guitar. <laughs> I mean, there could be somebody out there and if that's who you are, that's that's fantastic. So go ahead and pursue that and you can do that. But um for the rest of us that just uh doesn't work. Now, <clears throat> with that said, what about if you're past the beginning stages of playing guitar and you know, you've got all the essential skills, you You've got the rhythm guitar skills. You can play complete songs. You've got strumming technique. You can play riffs and some solos. You play in a band or something, or you jam with friends, and you can do that sort of thing. Maybe you know you lead songs around a campfire or something like that. But you get you've gotten to the point where you're like, mm, I I would like to kind of take my playing to the next level. I'd like to learn more about music. Um, I just want to explore more. Should you consider reading music at that point? Um, maybe, maybe that might, that might work. I think, it, uh, you might be better off learning some theory before you read, learn how to read standard notation. And specifically, I would say you might want to take a look at theory, uh, the way that I teach it, like in my fretboard theory books, or I have something similar called guitar theory for dummies. In those books, and then I have video courses on my website as well, when I teach theory, I'm really teaching a version of it that is heavily focused, or, well, I should say, it is specifically focused on the guitar fretboard and how popular songs are played. Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, Leonard Skinner, that, that sort of thing. Um, so I talk about, uh, you know, why do the song, why do the chords in Stairway to Heaven go together? You know, what's the connection there? Um, you know, what keys are, you know, certain popular songs in? Um, what scales are the melodies based in? What's, what scales are the riffs and solos based in? Why do those scales work over those chords? So I talk about that type of theory. That's a little bit different than traditional theory. Um, traditional music theory actually involved studying standard notation and the terminology and the, and the notation symbols that go along with that. Um, and it also included understanding chord construction and, and scale formulas and, and that sort of thing. But uh, it was very, very much wrapped around st uh, standard musical notation and specifically the piano uh, in, uh, in many cases. So the theory that I like to teach 
kind of removes all of that because a lot of that information just isn't very useful to guitar players, one, because we're dealing with this fretboard grid. And so um, sometimes it can be helpful to view aspects of music from the perspective of a different instrument like piano. But ultimately, we have to map everything out on this fretboard. And this fretboard works uh, differently than a piano. And we really rely on shapes and patterns and getting to know this fretboard. So when I teach theory, I say, okay, I'm not starting with notation. I'm not starting with the piano. We're going straight to the fretboard. Let me show you how things work on the fretboard. And if you're a guitar player and you're wanting to advance and understand uh, music better and um, you know, learn how to play better, you got to focus on the fretboard. So learning some sort of theoretical concept in and of itself is not going to be helpful. You have to figure out how does that translate to the fretboard and how do I actually make use of that in a familiar song. That's what you need to do. So I kind of reversed engineered it when I created my um, theory method. I started with, okay, let's, let's assume that that someone is into, you know, players like, you know, Eric Clapton and, and Jimi Hendrix and uh, Led Zeppelin and, and the Eagles and, you know, John Mayer, Dave Matthews, any sort of popular guitar player that plays pop and rock music. Let's say that they, they are wanting to play those things and they're on the guitar fretboard. How can I uh, help people understand how things are working from the fretboard? And then, if need be, can I connect this back maybe to some traditional terminology that would that would be useful like you know the mode names or you know um, uh, intervals or uh, you know uh, uh, other things so i kind of reversed engineered it and that's why my method has become so popular you can go on amazon and read my book reviews or read the reviews on my website for the video version of the course and you see everyone saying this is actually the information that i really wanted to learn all along does he get straight to the point and shows you how things actually work in the music that you uh, um, are listening to. So if you're at the level where you're beyond the basics, you have no trouble playing, you don't really need to develop your basic playing skills. And just to clarify what I mean by that, that means that you could go sit in with a band and play complete songs. You could sit around a campfire and strum, strum complete songs. If you're past that point, and you want to know how can you take it to the next level, I would recommend learning theory, specifically the type of theory that I, that I teach that, foc that uh, uh, focuses on the fretboard and emphasizes familiar rock songs. I think that would be the, uh, the next best step. Now let's say that you're already to that point and you've already been doing that. Maybe you've completed my theory course and you're like, okay, this is interesting. I'd like to, um, you know, uh, what else, what else can I do to kind of take it to the next level? Um, maybe that might include uh, learning how to read music. So I'll talk about, so let me talk about when you might want to learn how to read music. And let me also talk about what you can expect that to lead to and how you would actually use that skill. You'd actually use it a little differently than, um, than uh, you would think. First, I'll say this. Um, you know, we don't always have to be moving forward and trying to ad advance as a player. And tr we don't always need to be shooting to reach that next level. Um, when we look at a lot of our, or when I look at a lot of my favorite guitar players, they kind of got to a point, they got to a level where they were able to express themselves as artists and there wasn't really any need for them to move beyond that, you know? So, you know, I think about uh, players like uh, Don Felder and Joe Walsh and their work with the Eagles, which I'm a big fan of and I think it's fantastic. Well, if we go through and analyze that, um, it's, it's, you know, from a music theory perspective, it's not terribly difficult. There are definitely some interesting elements here and there. Hotel California is a pretty interesting chord progression. The way they play over the chords is uh, more complex than you would t typically hear in, uh, you know, in a rock song. Um, there's some jazz elements to it, but it certainly doesn't sound like they're playing jazz. 
Um, but many of their songs are much simpler, and they use you know uh, some basic major scale patterns or pentatonic uh, patterns. And there really was no need for those guitar players to try to do something any more complicated than that, because you know what they were working with really suit the music really uh, suited the music really well, and they were great players with great tone and great feel, and they made really good use of those elements. And so you might be a guitar player that is kind of at a level where it's like, yeah, you've got good rhythm guitar skills, you can play complete songs, you can play riffs, you can play some solos, you can improvise a little bit, and maybe you don't really need to advance beyond that. You know, it's like, a, you know, you could learn how to read music, but do you really need to? Like, what would be the point of that? Or you could go study jazz or learn how, you know, bebop jazz players improvise, but are you ever going to play in a jazz band? Would you ever use those skills playing the songs that you play in, in your current band? Maybe not. And so for you, you don't necessarily need to try to get to the next level. You're comfortable with the level where you are, and you just want to learn how to express yourself and just make good use of everything that you already know. And, I mean, there are guitar players who... There are artists who have had incredible careers uh, making wonderful music just kind of sitting at one level the whole time and making use of what, you know, some musicians might scoff at and say, well, that person is just basic stuff, major scales and some pentatonic. You know, think about the music of Tom Petty, for example. Well, Tom Petty has got a great body of work, and uh, I think that a lot of people would say, yeah, I wish I could just park it at that level and be that creative over that, you know, long period of time and make such, you know, great music. So I don't think that guitar playing is always about trying to get to the next level. It certainly is in the beginning stages, but at some point, you know, you have to say, like, this is good. I, I like where I'm at here. Now I really just want to focus on um, uh, using it. Okay, so let's say you're ready for something different, something more challenging, something that would uh, teach you more about music. Um, let's talk about reading music. Um, there are, uh, well, what do I want to say here? There are good reasons to learn how to read music. There are some benefits. You might enjoy it. I'll talk about that. But let me first say that you will probably be surprised that you're unlikely to use your sight reading skills much. So I've been playing guitar for decades. And, um, you know, I started playing guitar when I was like 13 or 14. And after I had been playing uh, a handful of years, I think maybe by the time I was 20 or so, I realized, you know, I'm getting pretty good at this. I, I want to get really serious, and I wanted to teach, and I thought, I need to learn how to read music. And so I actually went through the, the Mel Bay uh, grade one book here. I went through, I think I went through the first three books, one, two, and three. I completed them. And uh, by the time you get to the third book, you're playing in flat keys and stuff like that, and um, you're playing rhythms based on 16th note subdivisions and that sort of thing. And... I really felt like there wasn't really any reason for me to take it uh, any any farther than that for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, I wasn't all that good at it. Um, uh, I've been sight reading now for decades. Uh, I am put in some situations now on occasion where I do need to uh, sight read certain things. And I am no better at it today than I was <laughs> back when I first completed uh, those Mel Bay books. And it's just because my brain just doesn't work that way. Um, and it's just, you know, I play, I'm a field player. I play by ear. I like to think about stuff and map it out. Reading stuff on a page uh, just is not the best way for me to do things. And even though I ha have had to do it over the years, and even though I practiced it to try to improve that skill, it's, it's just not the way my brain naturally works. And I eventually got to the point where I was smart enough to realize that. And I said, you know, accept how well that you are able to do that, because it does help in some situations, but focus more on playing to your strengths, which is something I talk a lot about with my students. Figure out what you can do and do that well things that you can't do well, see if you can improve it. If you can, great. If you can't, 
then that's an indication that that shouldn't be something that um, it, it be, that your playing focuses on, right? There's so many things you can do on the guitar, so many things you can do as a musician. You can't be all things. Find those things that you can do well or those things that you can improve upon and and build your style around that. So I learned, I figured out that reading music was not going to be a strength of mine. Um, at any rate, so I learned how to... Um, so I did learn how to read music, but for most of my, you know, career, I never had sheet music put in front of me. So I was teaching lessons full time, and then I was playing in various bands. They were mostly cover bands, and we would play all sorts of events. And then I would also, you know, I recorded some CDs and stuff for for artists. I never really uh, went anywhere um, and played some gigs for original artists. But even in in those situations, it was really not much different than the cover band situation. They'd give me a CD and say, okay, learn these songs, and we're going to perform them, you know, this weekend, which is the same thing that I had to do when I played in cover bands for years. And throughout all that time, I was never handed sheet music. Never. Never. I was expected to be able to listen to it and figure it out by ear or go find the tablature and figure it out on my own. And in, in most of the time, uh, I had to perform those songs without having anything in front of me. Now, in some occasions, I might be able to have like a lyric sheet with some chords or maybe a number chart or something like that. But most of the time, you had to memorize stuff and, and play it from memory. So I wasn't really using those sight reading skills uh, because that's just not what's expected. And like I said earlier, when you go watch bands play and stuff, you will very rarely, if ever, see them reading standard notation. And you usually won't even see them reading charts. You know, they play from memory. And if you went out to see a band at a venue and everybody's eyes were glued to, uh, even if it was just a chart, you know, like an orchestra, you'd probably be a little disappointed. Like, what's going on here? Didn't these guys learn these songs? Um, so that was my... Um, experience too. So I'll tell you when the sight reading skill uh, did come in, come in handy though. Um, well, I'll, I'll put it like this. There are things that I learned about music that I learned through sight reading that helped me in situations when I wasn't sight reading. So when you, when you learn how to sight read, You've got to understand like what time signatures are. You know, a piece of music could be in 4-4 four, four, or 3-4. What does that mean? Well, it means there's four quarter notes in a measure, 4-4. Four, four, or there's three quarter notes, quarter notes in a measure, 3-4. And that um, changes how you count the music and where the um, measures change and the feel of the music. You could have music that's in, you know, 6-8 or 12-8. There's, di there's, there's different types of t time signatures. There's odd time signatures. And... If you're someone that's just kind of learned by ear, playing along with a lot of pop and rock music, most of it is in 4-4, four, four, but not all of it, and you, pr you, know, you just play back what you hear and you try to get the feel for it, but you may not totally understand like how the music really breaks down that way, and then you can find yourself in a situation where you kind of get stuck. You know, you're trying to learn a song, and for some reason you just can't get the feel of it. And maybe it's because it's in an odd time signature, and so you're so used to playing in 4-4 four, four or something like that that you just, it, the idea that something, a music wouldn't be subdivided like that is just not anything that you had experienced or even thought of, and you just don't even know what to make of it, and, and it can be uh, confusing. I do remember uh, uh, performing a song with the drummer once, and the song was uh, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head by B.J. Thomas. If you're familiar with the song, at the end of the song, I believe that they alternate between, is it 4-4 four, four and 5-4? Don't quote me on that. If I was more prepared, I would maybe have played a piece of that for you. And anyway, the drummer just kept derailing. He didn't understand, why, does, why is my beat not continuing to work over this? And he was struggling to... Uh, uh, pick up on the change, and I was kind of chuckling. I knew what was going on, so I'm sitting there playing the song, you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. I knew that there was that extra beat at it. I knew there was a measure of five, four. I think that's what, what was happening. So because of my experience, 
with reading music and getting to know time signatures and learning how to follow measures like that. When I would come across a piece of music that had something unusual in it, I could figure it out, quickly make sense of it, train myself to um, get the feel for it, whereas some musicians would struggle to do that. And I could say, well, you know, it's a measure of 5-4. And they either wouldn't understand what that meant, or if they did, they just it was really hard for them uh, uh, to get used to that. So that's a, that's a benefit. Um, you know, you learn how to follow the form of songs. Uh, you learn how to, you know, when you go to the, you play the first ending and when you have a repeat and when you go to the second ending or when you go to the coda and that sort of thing. And so it kind of helps you to have a, a different perspective in your mind of, of viewing um, uh, the form of a song, you know. So as I'm learning songs, even though I wouldn't even have sheet music um, as part of the process, I'm just learning them by ear or something to prepare for a gig. You know, I could listen to something and say, okay, so I basically have a verse, chorus, and bridge, but then there's that, th the first ending and the second ending after the second chorus are different, and then there's a repeat and there's a tag here, right? So that's what's going on in my mind because I'm kind of imagining what would this look like if it were in standard notation, and that can be helpful at times, and it makes it a little easier for me to kind of keep track of the form of a song, whereas another musician, if they're not used to thinking about music that way, might kind of struggle to, um, uh, to, to you know, to remember it. So, so that's an advantage. Uh, let's talk about some other advantages. So, you know, you have to learn how to read quarter notes and eighth notes and sixteenth notes and half notes and whole notes. You have to learn how note values are, are subdivided. You have to learn, you know, what it's like to rest on a beat or rest on the off beat or play on the, you know, the 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 and of two or the the uh of three um, or the e of one and all this stuff. You know, when you sub subdivide sixteenth notes, it's one e and a two e and a three e and a and this can be really helpful because these rhythms are all over popular music that you play. Um, and most people would just kind of listen to a part in music and just try to play it back from memory or try to get the feel for it. And uh, that that can work uh, for, most pe for most people most of the time. But there's always going to be those little sticky spots where you're just not sure, like, why do I keep missing that break, you know? And maybe it's because it's on kind of an odd part of the beat that you're not used to. And in those cases, it's really helpful to be able to count it out and say, you know, if I get my little foot tap going here, you know, wait, so what is it? It's 1E e and a 2E e and a 3E. Oh, it's 3E. Got it, you know? So then you have to review that and then you practice it. I'm just making up an, an example here. But it's little stuff like that that you have to learn how to count that stuff out when you're reading music. And you also see what it looks like in standard notation with 16th notes. So you also, also kind of have a visual representation of that that can be useful even when you're not uh, reading music. So, you know, counting is a, is a big uh, uh, part of this. And this is also going to help you communicate with other musicians too because it doesn't always work to just say, just listen to me, follow me, I'm going to break here, or here's, here's my rhythm, you know. That doesn't always work in some situations. Um, so it's often helpful um, to just talk amongst a group of musicians and say, okay, let's talk this down. There is an odd uh, um, uh, time signature at this measure. We're going to add a beat, and then we all break on the E of one or whatever. And to be able to just uh, have language that you can use to communicate with other musicians and have people on the same page to discuss some of those details makes it a lot easier um, to play together and uh, uh, communicate. So that's another benefit. And, and again, this is, this is even when you're not even reading music, you know. And uh, I've played in bands before where we never had sheet music. We were always expected to play by ear or learn the songs on our own in our own time, however we, wanted, however we learned it from the recording. But uh, I would say that usually the... the, the, the the best musicians that I played with were ones that had some amount of experience with sight reading. Maybe they played piano as a kid or they were, they took drum lessons and had to learn how to read like drum music and count rhythms or they were a guitar player and they went through a Mel Bay grade one or something like that. Um, it was really helpful in situations when we needed to talk something down or make sure that we were on the same page and, and, and uh, playing together. Now, 
uh, most of the people listening to this are probably not going to be playing at that at that level. I mean, I'm talking about you know playing in bands where we were playing three to five nights a week and doing you know bars and clubs and hotel lounges and weddings and private parties and special events and that sort of thing. So uh, you know what were considered to be high dollar uh, you know cover band gigs and that sort of thing. Many of you are never going to be in that situation where it's like all of a sudden, okay, we got a wedding this Saturday night, and they've requested these songs. We got to add these songs to our set list. We got to get them down quickly, and that sort of thing. You know, many of you might not be in that situation, so it may not be as critical that um, uh, you know this sort of stuff may not be as critical. If you're just playing once a month with your buddies and you're just doing some old classic classic rock songs that don't have anything you know, too unusual happening in them and their songs that you've listened to and played for years, then you may not really need to talk this stuff down or um, get into the details uh, of rhythm or anything like that. But I was certainly in some situations where that was uh, very helpful. And so that was a big benefit of reading music. And I would say that that's probably the biggest benefit. I learned how to read music and then I took away those benefits that I used when I wasn't reading music. Very rarely did I ever have um, sheet music put in front of me. There were a few times when I was offered uh, a gig and I turned it down because it was a sight reading gig. So I do remember many years ago, someone wanting to hire me to uh, play guitar for a musical uh, theater performance. And you know, I asked them what that process was like and they had charts that you had to read. It, was, it, it wasn't music that I was used to playing, and I needed to... Uh, they didn't have charts, excuse me. It was standard notation. It was actual standard musical notation all written out, and I had to play all these lead lines and stuff like that. And I told the guy, I'm not your guy. I'm out. I don't have, I don't have those strong of sight reading skills, um, and it wasn't something that I wanted to sit down and study and rehearse um, and put a lot of time into for the performance because I don't even know if it was really paying that much and I'm just like I'll pass but honestly I've only passed on that literally once or maybe twice in all the years that that I have uh, um, uh, been playing there was another situation where I was playing with the group and um, they this was more recently and I was playing for some uh, special events here in uh, the Nashville area where they wanted people who could just show up. Like the guy who, who led the event said, don't worry about learning the songs. It's just a sight reading gig. Just show up and we're going to have, we're going to have the music for you and you can just read it down. And, uh, um, I actually performed a few times and I was able to do some prep work ahead of time. And, um, and I played and it went well, but I just told the guy, I said, this is too much work for me. I can't, I can't just show up and read standard notation down cold, particularly these these uh, uh, songs we were doing. We were doing songs by like Toto and like these these complicated songs, and um, I couldn't I couldn't play all the, through those lead lines just um, reading them down that way. I had to do some prep work ahead of time, and even then, it was just a lot of work. And I told the guy, I'm not the right fit for this uh, particular gig. Um, so. There are some cases where uh, I guess I missed out on work or I, I chose to decline work, but 99% of the time, no one ever expected me to, um, uh, to, to read music, and it wasn't anything that uh, uh, got in the way of me uh, getting a gig or um, getting work. Now, with all that said, I do occasionally have to read a little bit of standard notation when I play at church. So I regularly play at church on, on Sunday. Uh, I live here in the Nashville, Tennessee area. Um, some people call this the buckle of the Bible belt. Uh, Nashville is also called Music City. So music and church are kind of a big deal around here. And my church is no exception. So uh, we have a lot of professional players, people that work in the music industry and stuff that attend my church. And the uh, the quality of the worship, um, if you're evaluating it from a musical standpoint, um, is quite good. And um, they have an expectation that if you serve in that ministry, that you're an experienced player and that you can, um, you're can you able to read any charts or music that they uh, give to you. Now, we mainly use... Uh, number charts or what's called rhythm charts 
which is just basically kind of like an outline of, of the of the song and you know the basic chord changes and just uh, the form of the song and you're expected to comp uh, I believe that's short for composition you're supposed to comp your own parts so you look at the song you see verse chorus verse chorus the main chord changes and you're expected to just make up your own parts that um, uh, you know f uh, fit the feel of the music and fill in the space following those basic uh, following that basic chart. That's what we do most of the time, but every now and then there would be something notated where the guitar needed to play a specific lead line or maybe the whole band was going to play a unison figure um, uh, together. But fortunately, um, when that happened, the part was usually fairly simple and it was usually just a small part. So, And we always got the charts ahead of time and we actually rehearse, um, uh, well we usually rehearse on Wednesday for the Sunday uh, services. Um, so I would always have an opportunity to see that and work it out because I'm not very good at just always, unless it's super simple, I can't just sight read something. I It takes me a minute to figure out like, okay, what are those notes again? And wait, that's, uh, what beat is that? That's the end of, you know, it, that's just how my brain works. Even after all these years, I still have to kind of uh, take a moment uh, to work it out. But I always have the opportunity to do that. And in some cases, I might even scribble like on my chart uh, that, oh, this is mainly just a pentatonic riff. And I might say that's just a B major pentatonic riff. And I just kind of memorize it or something. And then when it comes up in the music, I see, oh, play that one riff um, that I worked out previously by working the notes out individually. So if you're someone that plays at church, you know that uh, you might be in a similar situation uh, where you're handed um, music, typically not full sheet music, but it might just be like a rhythm chart or some, or a lead sheet or something like that, where you're just following the, the, the main chord changes and you comp your part, and there might be a few little things here and there that you need to read. But in that situation, it is helpful if you have some sight reading experience because you have to learn how to follow the measures and uh, follow the form of the song and not miss the repeats and not miss the uh, first ending and second ending and stuff like that. Um, so even though you're not actually reading the notes in the notation, it's still helpful to understand how to follow. All right, so I think I've explained some, some situations where... Um, you might need to read standard notation and how it could come into use. But I think you get my point here that mainly if you choose to, to learn how to read music, there's kind of other benefits that you're going to take away from it that's going to help you in situations where you're not reading music, which is likely going to happen uh, uh, most of the time. So you're just, it's just not a skill. It's, you know, learning how to read music it has benefits, but it's not a skill that you're really going to rely upon much. I should add that there are times when, if I'm learning how to play something from tablature, I always prefer tablature. I think that if you're learning something familiar, the tablature is absolutely necessary because the standard notation by itself doesn't help you because it doesn't, you know, on the guitar fretboard, there are multiple places where you can play the identical pitches. And it's, it's critical to understand where a particular chord form was built or in what position something should, should be played. Um, you know, like if you're uh, playing something like an, you know, a B minor pentatonic scale, you know, and you see that in notation, well, you might be reading the notation and you're going to start here, you know, and you might end up playing in a position or making use of some open strings or something because you're just focusing on the notes and you miss the fact that, oh, I see, it's it's actually just climbing straight up pattern one. I should be up here in this position or, or something like that. And that's that's the nature of the, the guitar and guitar players, even guitar players who do sight read, like classical guitar players, they still can't sight read the same way that a, pia a, a piano player or even a violinist can because... There's, they still have to look at the music, but then they have to figure out where, what's the best position to play these notes? How should I be positioned? And if you're familiar with classical guitar music, there's actually added numbers and stuff to it to try to indicate in which, which position you should be in. So it just gets more complicated for guitar, even if you're going to be playing music that is uh, typically uh, notated in standard no uh, uh, notation.
At any rate, so I like to use tablature. You know, if I'm learning how to play a Jimi Hendrix solo or something, I'm always going to want to have the recording in front of me. I'm going to listen to it, and I'd like to see um, a tablature, if it's good tablature, um, in front of me. But then I will, and I'm mainly focusing on the tablature, but I peek at the standard notation now and then just to... Uh, just to see kind of rhythmically like what's happening, you know, to make sure I didn't miss a rest, like, oh, there's a rest there, then I play after that. Or just to look at the way the notes are subdivided, like, oh, th this is triplets, you know, I'm going to play this and that's going to be triplets. So I kind of peek up and I'm just kind of looking at the rhythms to get an idea of rhythmically how things go, uh, go together. So I do find that helpful. I'm relying mainly on the tab, but that notation can give me a little extra information the tab doesn't uh, provide. And because I'm familiar with how to read that, uh, that's helpful. So that's another benefit. All right, so if you want to learn how to read music, what do I suggest? Um, I learned the old-fashioned way with, you know, Mel Bay's Modern Guitar Method. I went through the first three books. There are similar methods out there like Hal Leonard and Berkeley or something like that. And they're all similar. They teach you the very ba basics of the staff and, you know, note values and you play some old-fashioned melodies and that sort of thing. Um, and you just have to work through it. Um, I have taught reading music to my some students over the years when they were ready for that or if they wanted to do that. I like making sure you have the recording. This comes with a, a CD here, but I think probably if you buy the book today, they probably make the audio tracks available online. I think that's important because I... Um, even though I was teaching myself how to read music, I wanted to hear it to, to check my work and make sure I was playing it correctly. Oftentimes I made mistakes and I realized, oh, that was supposed to be an E flat. And well, I kept reading that wrong. But when I listened to it, I realized I wasn't playing it right. I also liked to um, uh, uh, read the music while playing along with the track so that I could um, train myself to read and play in time with the music. If you've been following me at all, you know that I emphasize that with everything that you do, whatever you're learning how to play, make sure you're playing in time with music like you're part of the band. So um, I uh, recommend you do that even with a sight reading method. And I would say, you know, see if you can get through one book or something like that and see, and see how you like it. Um, if you're really serious, like I was when I was younger, and you had the intention of, of trying to play music, music professionally, um, uh, and you knew you were going to be in situations where you needed to have some sight reading experience, uh, I would say work your way up to uh, playing 16th notes. I think that, that would, you should at least get to that point, you know, where you're playing melodies and reading parts down that, that you know, have rhythms that are based on some type of 16th note rhythm and you learn how to count those. I would say at the very least do that. In fact, I might say that if you get to that point, that's probably going, going to be enough um, studying. Then you can just focus on putting that skill to use by going out and, and uh, doing the music work that you're uh, uh, preparing yourself uh, to do. Uh, so that's what I'd recommend. You don't have to learn how to read like a concert violinist. Guitarists typically don't read that way. It's just very, very unusual for a guitar player to, to read that way because guitar players and concert violinists just play in a totally different way. Guitar players are expected, in most cases, to play from memory, to be able to comp their own rhythm, improvise their own solos. Concert violinists are not. You know, orchestra players are... Uh, and uh, expected to be able to play exactly what is written most of the time, exactly what is written. No, imp you know, no, <laughs> no improvisation. So the, you know, their skill is 100% uh, completely wrapped around sight reading, you know? So you don't, and, and, and I've had students in the past whose parents put pressure on them and on me saying, I want my son to be able to play guitar and sight read anything, you know, like an orchestra player. And I had to tell the parents, that's unrealistic. That is unrealistic. And it's just not, it's, it's not good to put that pressure on a, uh, a guitar student. I never have. And, and uh, so you shouldn't put it on yourself either. You know, you can learn how to read music. You don't have to, you don't have to be as good as an orchestra player uh, for there still to be a lot of benefit. Uh, for it. So one last thing I'll talk about. So I live here in the Nashville area, and there are many professional guitar players. There are players who are far more skilled and far more experienced th than I am, who do a lot of um, uh, 
you know, tour with major artists that uh, you know record albums and do a lot of studio work. I've gotten to know some of these uh, uh, p people. I've gotten to sit in on sessions and see how they work. And so you might be wondering, well, what's happening in that world? Um, can guitar players still get by at that level and in that situation without reading music? Um, uh, yes, they can, believe it or not. Uh, but most of them do have some experience with reading music. But I would like to point out that uh, there really are very few people that are in that situation. And, you know, becoming like a session player in a town here like Nashville is uh, really, really hard to do because, um, you know, well, supply and demand Everyone would love to do that. Everyone would love to be that guy that goes on tour with a major artist or that guy that sits in the studio all day and tracks all these songs for all these albums. But, uh, you know, the amount of work that's actually available compared to all the people that would love to be part of that is, you know, grossly out of proportion. Um, and so typically that studi studio work is going to go to those players that really have that really are best equipped to do that. And it really takes a very special uh, musician to do that. I've done a little bit of studio work here and there, but I'd be the first to admit that I am not cut out to do it as well as some, some people are. Um, I might do a video or a podcast on this um, uh, topic in the future, but I guess for now I'll just say that... Um, well, I guess I already said it, you know, some people are just really, really good at that and can do it so well and so quickly. They can be put on the spot. They can have a chart put in front of them for a song that they're, that doesn't even exist yet. And someone could say, you know, this is the feel and the groove we want on this song. And uh, we're going to give you a click track and just we want you to just put together, you know, um, the, the first layer, however you imagine it going. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three, four, and boom. They'll play the whole thing down, reading the chart, not missing a chord, playing this perfect rhythm that was in the style that the, you know, the, the producer had requested with the perfect guitar tone. And it's almost like a superhuman skill. You're like, where is this idea coming from? How does this person understand how to do this? You know, literally creating something out of thin air without having any sort of reference because the song doesn't exist yet. So it's not like they can listen to something and copy it. They're creating it on the spot. <clears throat> and uh, they're doing it in a manner where the end product, after all the instrumentation has been tracked and the vocals have been added and everything, the producer listens back and says, yes, that's exactly how I wanted the guitar parts to go. And these studio musicians just have, they're able to, you know, envision that and play that way. And that's just a skill that I don't have, you know. I'm the type of person where I'd be like, can I have some sort of demo? Can I hear the singer singing this? Can I get an idea of what the song feels like? Can you give me a chart? Can I go home and kind of study it and work out some ideas and work out some tones and maybe come back next week and, and record this? Um, and if you give me an opportunity to do that, I probably would be, would be able to do a good job and the end product would be good. The trouble is I would need more time. I would need more information. I'd have to put a lot of thought into it. But the top studio players will do it on the spot upon request. Um, <clears throat> and that is the most important uh, part of being a studio player. You have to be able to follow a chart, a basic chart, which is kind of an outline of the song and, and the chords. And in, here in Nashville and, and other studios, you got to learn the number system. So sometimes instead of writing actual chord letters, if you're playing in the key of G, it'll just say key of G, you know, verse, one, four, five, chorus, one, five, six, four, that sort of thing. You know, bridge, key change, key of F, you know, you know, one, six, two, five, or whatever, something like that. And so you have to be familiar with how that works, and then you kind of comp your own uh, parts uh, based on that. So that's really important, <clears throat> but studio players are, uh, they're not always expected to actually have a piece of sheet music put in front of them, and they're playing something down like an orchestra player. They are usually expected to comp their own parts and create it on the spot. So that's kind of like the number one skill. But <clears throat> there are situations, and I've seen it, as I've said in on some sessions, where um, 
you know, there was an arranger involved with a piece of music, <clears throat> and they had something specific that they wanted the instruments to play at one point or another. And so you'd have a basic chart, but then all of a sudden, here comes the bridge, and there's a guitar line that's notated, and they want you to play that particular melody at that point. Or maybe there's a, a, a section of the bass line that they wanted to be real specific at one point, so it's actually notated out. And the best studio players can not only read that chart down and comp their own parts and fill in the space perfectly and play together, and it's tight and it's grooving and perfect tone, but then when those spots come up where they need to play something specific, they can read it right down and play it perfectly the first time on the first, if not the first take, the second take. Most of the uh, sessions that I sat in on, everything was done in one or two takes. They were absolutely amazing. So being a session player at that level is hard because it really uh, it requires someone to have a tremendous amount of talent um, and so much so that it was hard for me to wrap my mind around how well and quickly these people were working. I was just like, wow, I just can't imagine being able to do that. And it also requires you to be at least a good chart reader, but have some sight reading skills too. And I would say probably the, the most successful session players can do all of that. If you want them to just comp and feel, they can do it. If you want to put something in front of them that they have to read down on the spot in the first take um, and play correctly, they could do that as well. So um, pretty rare to have someone that can do that. And it's pretty rare. There are not a lot of opportunities for people who can do that. Like I said, supply and demand. Um, the best session players who can do what I'm talking about, they're going to be sitting in the studio, you know, five, six days a week sometimes 10, 12 hours a day, knocking out song after song. They might spend 30 minutes to an hour and knocking out songs. They do it so quickly and so well that um, time is money, and the studio can't afford to bring in something that's going to bring in somebody like me that's going to take a much longer period of time to complete a song than another person. They want that person that can just kick it out um, Instantly. I didn't intend for this to turn into a, a, a message about pursuing studio work, but I do have some people that actually ask me about that. Like, ah, I love guitar. I think maybe someday I'd like to be a studio musician. And uh, so here's a little bit of a reality check. It really takes a very special type of person to be able to do that well because these studios have those types of people available to them and they're always going to choose those people over someone that's going to take much longer time to complete something or not be able to complete it as well or not be able to read when they need to read. As far as being a touring musician or something, um, you know, when you go see acts play, they don't have sheet music in front of them. You're expected to have all your music memorized. Um, and in that case, there's a little bit more flexibility. They usually would give you copies of the music or some charts, and you would go to rehearsal, but then you would practice playing those with, uh, uh, by memory. So it may not, may not be necessary that you're able to sight-read stuff down on the spot in certain situations. Um, but it might be likely that as you prepare for those rehearsals before the tour begins, that you are handed some sheet music for some parts and you're expected to be able to make sense of it on your own time or at rehearsal or something like that. So I'm sure that some sight reading skills do come into uh, uh, to play. All right, well, I think I've said enough about this topic. Hopefully I've um, addressed all of the questions that you might have. I've received questions about this uh, uh, you know, over the years and so I'm familiar with mo what most people ask. If you have any um, additional questions, you can always post them in the comments or send me an email, and I'd be happy to uh, answer. So long story short, if you're like most people and you just want to play guitar for fun and play familiar songs, should you learn how to read music initially? No, I don't think that's the best place to spend your time. Just learn how to play. Learn your chords and songs and get started. If you need help with that, go to my website, guitarmusictheory.com. Answer the questions I ask you about your playing, and I will get you uh, hooked up with a free course that'll be at your level and show you how to get your skills together and what you should be working on uh, right now. If you're already at an intermediate or maybe even an advanced level and you have no trouble playing, but you're just curious about learning more about music, maybe taking things to the next level, maybe being able to communicate better with other musicians or take advantage of 
uh, more opportunities that would require you to have some sight reading experience, then I'd say go for it. Give, give it a shot. The nice thing is you don't have to get terribly good at it. You could just complete a couple of beginner level books and that might give you just enough um, exposure to it, um, uh, you know, to, uh, <clears throat> to, to, to benefit your playing. If you're interested in learning how to improve your playing, but you don't really think that sight reading is something that you want to explore, but you're not really sure what to do, head to my website, guitarmusictheory.com. I've got some free courses for people at different levels, and I'll help you determine uh, what level you're at and what you should be working on now. So answer the question I ask you about your playing, and then I'll give you some options. Click on those options. You can get yourself enrolled in a free course. I'll help you fill gaps in your playing and move forward with your playing today for free. Go to guitarmusictheory.com. All right, guitar engineers. Well, thanks for uh, listening and watching. My name is Desi Serna. Uh, if you like this video, please click like. Maybe leave me some comments uh, below and let me know what you learned. Or if you have any additional insight you'd like to share, leave it in the comments for other people to see. Before you go, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Click on the notification bell to receive alerts when new videos are uploaded. Then keep playing and stay tuned for more.